Okay, we are in the studio here with author Martin Lee, author of Acid Dreams. Uh, we had Martin here in the past, and we have his earlier shows in the info box if you'd like to get more of a background on Martin. Uh, Martin, what have you been up to lately? Well, thinking about the Entheogenesis Conference. I'm going to give a talk there. You, you're uh, one of our speakers at the Entheogenesis Conference. There's links to that as well at the bottom of the info box. What are you talking about there? Uh, early uh, uh, 20th century mescaline circles in Europe, uh, French, German primarily, in 1930s, 1920s, 30s. So who's, who's dropping <clears throat> the old peyote derivatives? Well, uh, Sartre, uh, definitely, and... Uh, Merleau-Ponty, uh, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, the other great, uh, uh, oh, they, you know, they were comrades in political and philosophical struggle. Uh, in many ways, Merleau-Ponty is his mentor in politically. Um, but he writes about mescaline in his, uh, ma you know, his masterpiece, the Phenomenology of Perception. Uh, Merleau-Ponty held the chair of uh, philosophy at the Sorbonne when he, when he uh, died in a car accident. But, uh, really important works in Western philosophy in this century, uh, and uh, they both, um, you know, some interesting things to say. Interesting was, things happened there. Th that's on the left wing side, and you have the right wing side as well. Uh, uh, we'll get into that in a second. Yeah. But there was um, was this before or after uh, Huxley wrote Heaven and Hell? Uh, long before. Okay. This is uh, almost a generation before. We're talking about the uh, mid 1930s, early yeah. 1930s, sometimes late 19. 20s when uh, uh, some doctors, German doctors, uh, French doctors began to experiment with it on people and, and uh, artists and intellectuals, uh, radical types on both left and right were drawn to it and, and uh, uh, well, that's interesting to me. Yeah, for sure. Was it a, a pharmaceutical product at the time? Did, so no. Or is it just derived by scientists all over the place? The peyote, uh, you know, the, the chemical in peyote, the active ingredient had been extracted and, and, and reproduced, and that's basically that's a mescaline. Uh, but it's really before there was uh, specific medical uses, you know, pinned to it. It just, there, there was, I mean, the doctors are working in a tradition of seeing uh, uh, mental illness and, and uh, being stoned as sort of being equivocal in some sense. Or, uh, and so, uh, I mean, they inherit the tradition of... Uh, you know, from the 19th century, that perspective with the hashish studies and, and all that. Right. Uh, but also, I think that, the, well, look, Herman Hesse is one of those interested in, you know, in a book, Step in I mean, Great works of literature were, were catalyzed. And nausea, Sartre's nausea, which is truly one of the great works of literature of the 20th century, along with Steppenwolf, I would say. Um, pretty the last third of that book, you know, when he, when he goes in, on, on the trip. Um, but you had writer, I mean, Hesse was a pacifist. Ernst Jung was a warmonger. I mean, he wrote The Storm of Steel, the great celebration of battle in, in, in the trenches in World War I, and then, you know, inscribed his book to Hitler after Hitler had, you know, personally had, had uh, taken power. I mean, at that point, you know, it's pretty, if you didn't know where Hitler was coming from then, you know, later on he distanced himself and so forth and so on. And it, realistically, but for many different sorts of interesting reasons. Very important figure, Ernst Jünger, in terms of the uh, psychedelic history, uh, certainly the most important writer in the German language on psychedelics. Is, right? is that where the Nazis got their mescaline background from before they started using it in experiments at Dachau? Um, it could have been. It could have been that uh, I.G. Farben or Sandoz, whatever, was tipped off to, uh, uh, you know, this type of stuff. But it was being, it was part medical, it was in hospitals that it was being distributed. And Dr. Beringer in Germany was one such person who was turning people on. Albert Hoffman and I actually spoke about this when I, when I visited him a few years ago, about the circle. Because he, he, he was a great, uh, he'd be a fan of Younger. Right, well, which, I, uh, that's very interesting. I, he seemed a little left-wing to me, uh, uh, Hoffman, or at least... No? I don't see it as left or right wing. He's a nature mystic, really. But 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 he Junger with a lot of Junger is such a powerful writer yeah. and was the greatest writer of German language about the psychedelic experience. And, and 
and, and there's a certain kind of, I mean, it deals with violent and martial themes, and yet there's a certain kind of violence to a psychedelic experience. I mean, it is such a profound rupture it can be. But there's something that lent itself to, to Junger's talents as a, as a writer, which are very impressive. You know, I, I, I couldn't underscore that more. Uh, as I understand it, Sandoz wasn't really looking to create psychedelics. They were experimenting with plants for certain medical uses, and they yeah. kind of stumbled across the psychedelic ones. Uh, Albert Hoffman, both synthesizing LSD for the first time and later on um, the psilocybin uh, derivatives. Yeah. Um, what, um, and then... I think we're really lucky that he was the person that did that, because he... He, like I said, he's a nature mystic, and, and his, uh, uh, you know, to, to bring that into the psychedelic experience that he discovered, you know, mm -hmm. is a profound combination, obviously. And, and so. then in the 40s and 50s and 60s, the, uh, the kind of right wing or control freaks, like, for example, the CIA or the Nazi mind scientists, tried to take these psychedelics and apply them to thought control, mind control, that sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, the, the Nazis very much were a predecessor. We were talking about that a little bit before. Yeah. The, the, the experiments at Dachau, the Nazis were doing, and the mescaline experiments for, I, it was generally in the context of interrogation, but more, I think, wider, just control, what will it do to a person's mind? And they had the inmates at Dachau to experiment on, and, they, and this, this, uh, the records of these experiments that the Nazi, Nazi doctors accumulated there some of the chief doctors at Dachau later come to the United States and work in the space program, space medicine program and whatnot. But uh, it's... Uh, they they it's, came to the uh, U.S., and a lot of them went to work for the CIA. And there's yeah. a lot of documentation that they tried to use these drugs as ways to program assassins, for example, and to control, you know, large groups of people or to mess with crowds. Is that... Your yeah. research says yeah, that too? Yeah, all of the above. I mean, yeah. initially it was mainly interrogation yeah. and more so obvious kind of espionage things, knockout pills or mm -hmm. whatnot. But then they get real creative, like antivitamins they get into. You know, subtle weakening for interrogation if you're holding a person long term, if you can kind of, kind of derange their sensibility slowly by denying them with certain vitamins or uh, whatever. And, and injecting diseases, not, not necessarily injecting, but exposing people to diseases or chemicals that could cause heart attacks or strokes. That was certainly on the CIA's, uh, what was more on the, just on the drawing board. They explicitly developed drugs for this. And there, there's very explicit, I mean, the documentation I went through that, that showed that this is the case, that assassination techniques, that's yeah. part of what they, the reason why this is grouped together, okay, drugs can do a lot of different things. They yeah. can kill you and they can also, uh, you know, flip you out, and, you know, or, or you know, you know, whatever, amp you up, or, uh, but... Uh, and that, that yeah. rumor that they tried to uh, poison uh, Fidel Castro so he'd go crazy during one of his speeches, that you ever come across that? Yeah, that's a true scenario. That's they a true actually... Scenario. They, 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 uh, Face the executioner, shut the logging camps all down, get busy planting hemp, leave the trees there in the ground. Life is too precious on this little spinning pearl. Cause we don't want your bulldozers, we just want the world. This is Howard Hughes moved biopic now. I didn't see the whole, I actually the aviator. watched Aviator? Yeah, I watched about three quarters of it the other night with friends in San Francisco with, with Michael Horowitz and, and Winona Ryder, actually. Uh, and then we got, it was so late we wanted to sleep and then watched the next thing, the last part of it. So I didn't see when they really got into the political stuff with Hughes, how they dealt with it, but... Howard Hughes is very important in terms of the CIA mafia plots because Robert Mayhew comes from Howard Hughes. Uh, he's his, you know, he's his public face. I mean, he's his main guy. When he Hughes is in his reckless face, you know, and Mayhew is the guy that the CIA goes to to find the mobsters to bump off Castro. So he's this intermediary between Hughes, the mob, the CIA, that, and that's the kind of embodies. It's a, it's a microcosm, a micro, yeah, of the macrocosm of the Hughes empire. It's very important in that regard. And, and when I tell people that the CIA were like the main importers of drugs into America, a lot of people scoff, but that's one of the most well-founded, you know. I would put it like this. I think one has to be very careful and sometimes nuanced uh, in terms of uh, defining these relationships. Because a lot of stuff is going on. I mean, I've talked to Green Beret, former Green Berets, who 
described offloading bags of heroin on the tarmac of Air America, you know, in, in La Laos and so forth, that, that this was going on, you know. Yeah. Um, and all kinds of scams were running. There were private scams and there was official covert scams, yeah. and, you know, whatever. But basically there's channels yeah. that the CIA, um, uh, you know, influences. Uh, it started they're, with the Italian. Uh, they're not exactly CIA channels, but they're but they're channels that the CIA uh, runs with in yeah, different they, ways. They started it, with uh, with needing the Italian mafia to invade Italy and cutting deals with them. Yeah, and then later on, I'll it tell was, you a story about that. Okay, it's no, please funny. interrupt me. Uh, I interviewed once a long time ago in Washington D.C. in a hotel a guy who looked like the picture of death. He had a bald head, I mean, just shrunken. He must have been about 90. Colonel Earl Brennan, who was in charge of the OSS operations in Sicily, and I turned on the tape recorder and he leans over, and I, I, I was so you have to understand, I was so shocked by his physical appearance in a way. But he leans over. we had the best group of thugs, assassins, hitmen. Murderers, da 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 da, -da, -da you know, yeah. racketeers, uh, uh, you know, they were all working for me, and, uh, and it was just, you know, yeah. very, very clear on that. I mean, it, yes, it was a marriage of expedience. The mafia had a kind of a ambiguous relationship with Mussolini regime too, and uh, so, it could, and it was kind of a secret society, and of course, and Mussolini had some problems with secret society. So Freemasonry as well com comes into this. They're early going now. That's a very, very interesting story. How the CIA first the, it was Brennan again. Brennan was a Freemason. Yeah. Uh, and Brennan's uh, disciples in the OSS, the key guys, are the guys that run the, you know, help resurrect Italian Freemasonry ten years before the P2 scandal, but they helped lay the whole thing and then they put jelly in there, you know, jelly in there. You know about losing yeah, jelly. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to go off on too much of a tangent, but yeah, that's an area of great interest to me, that, that whole story. And that's a big drug story, too, yeah. because this, the, the banking networks associated with these Freemasonic. Um, uh, brotherhoods yeah. that the CIA helped spawn. That's not to say they controlled it entirely, but but certainly they were spawned by uh, the need for channels, back channels th through into secret service organizations and business, you know, the heads of business empires and whatnot. Freemasonry is one such network. In, Old in boys Italy. clubs. Yeah. Hey. So, uh, but there are drug networks to this. They're very yeah, important. Speaking of a big, big drug network, mm -hmm. 